All right, friends. It is seven o'clock. And so we're going to officially open this program. I want to welcome everybody and thank you for tuning in with us tonight. I'm Catherine Wells, president of Denton County Master Gardener Association, and welcome to our spring 2022 Flower Mound Garden Series in partnership with the Flower Mound Public Library. Um, we've been delighted to partner with them for this annual series for, it's our 12th or 13th year now, right, Linda? Uh, yeah, and Linda Harvey's been our wonderful program manager, and she's also a really wonderful speaker, and she's going to present to us tonight. Um, she is a veteran master gardener and is so talented in so many different subjects. But before I uh, turn the floor over to her, I did want to let you know that we've had, this will be our third of our four programs with the Flower Mound Garden Series this spring. If you missed the first two, permaculture design and last week's bees in the ecosystem, you can catch them on our YouTube channel. They were recorded and they are available there. So you can just search for Denton County Master Gardener Association on YouTube and you can search all our videos or you can search by playlist. We've recently added some categories to help you find what you're looking for and the topic that you're interested in. And then also just to let you know, next week on February 28th, uh, the program will be Gardening for the Birds, and that will be presented by Cecil Carter from the Native Plant Society of Texas, the Trinity Forks chapter. So please make, um, please make plans to tune in for that um, if you haven't already. And so I'm going to turn this over to Linda now. As I said, Linda Harvey is the project manager for our Flower Mound Garden Series. She's also the project manager for our Denton County Youth Fair. So many other things. She is just such an asset to our association and to our community. She's an excellent speaker and a knower of so many things. And Linda, I'm really excited to learn more about growing microgreens tonight. So I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you, Catherine. And thank you everyone for joining. And um, I did do this presentation, a smaller one or a shorter one for uh, a youth group. And uh, the one young lady asked me why I picked this topic because it was a hot topic during the pandemic. Uh, many people who discovered making bread, baking bread and growing microgreens. So it's a very fun thing to do. And I hope you enjoy this presentation. Agenda wise, we're gonna talk about exactly what are microgreens. Then we'll look at the supplies that you should have to do this project. We'll step through how to grow and a few troubleshooting uh, points or things I found out through trial and error. So let's get started. I'd like to do a disclaimer. As master gardeners, we, we're uh, just objective about what we present. And I did do research for this as my, I do on the other programs. And uh, because of the research, I may show a vendor or a product as part of the research. We don't condone or condemn any of these subjects or just for educational purposes. So you can make your own choices. So what are microgreens? They're very young vegetables, approximately one to three inches tall, and they are commonly grown indoors. And very important is they're delicious. They're concentrated in their flavor. They're very fresh and they have excellent nutritional value as well as a good source of fiber. And we'll, we'll look at details of exactly how good they are. Now, uh, how to serve them or how to use them, well, they're fine as a snack, but you can add them to stir fries, salads, soups. It, it's just an extra punch or an extra twist to a, uh, something you might already be enjoying. Now, what makes microgreens a different, and let me try to make, Catherine, can you tell me if those, that bar is across the top? Are you seeing the bar across the top? We're not, so you're okay. probably okay. just seeing it on your end. That's fine. I wanted to make sure everyone could see this screen. So what makes microgreens different from sprouts and seedlings? 
Well, sprouts are generally grown in water and they're very short uh, to maturity, grow in three to five days and you eat the whole thing. Whereas in micrograins, you're growing them in soil or a growing medium and they're usually done in a week to 14 days, though you may see some that might take about a month or so. They're very quick to grow. You eat the leaves, but we're going to look at which particular leaves you eat from these microgreens because they're very young. And seedlings are also grown in soil. They are longer lived and they are going to be a more mature plant eating the leaves and or the fruits of those. So let's take a look by what we mean by the maturity and how they're growing. And this is showing a seed. It's really a bean seed, not the best graphic example I could find. But uh, as they sprout, as they germinate, the first thing that really comes up is this cotyledon, cotyledon and I, I have another picture here. It's these little green leaf likes that come out. Very first thing that, that is um, part of the plant erupting from its seed. And these are what you're usually going to eat for the microgreens. Sometimes you'll also eat the first true leaves, but for the most part, many of the ones we're going to be looking at today, we're eating the cotyledon portion. So that uh, the one in the upper right is actually one that I grew and uh, snipped it off to show you, and that's a little broccoli erupting with its first true leaves. Nutrition-wise, I said it's nutritious. Well, you can get a lot of vitamins A, B, C, and K, and depending on which microgreen you're growing, there's D and E, as well as look at those mineral content across the board there. Plus, something I didn't expect was protein. There is a protein percentage in the vegetables. So pick your, if you need a particular supplement, you might choose a particular microgreen to supplement your regular diet plan. Here's some eatsies or ways that you can use the micro microgreens. Certainly it makes a very attractive appetizer. They'll think you slaved away in order to serve this appetizer and it gives it a very fresh appearance too. Put them on pizza. I have there on seafood, that's those uh, crab flakes. I just put some, let me see what I put on there. Well, on the popcorn, I put broccoli. On the seafood, I put radishes and it gave it a nice pop. And on my tomatoes there, in addition to the feta, I put in pak chow. Excellent, delicious, and it, just, it actually tastes a lot like spring when you do this. You can add them to tacos, uh, just about any uh, savory dish, as well as you could add them to pastry. So you could add them to sweetened dishes also, depending on, again, which microgreen. Let's talk about our supplies now, what supplies you uh, can use or have on hand. Now this presentation is geared to having no special equipment, and we're going to do this economically. Try it, see if you like it with minimal expense. We're going to be very practical about what we're using, but also safety, of course, because you're going to be eating this. This is not meant to be for commercial production of microgreens. Many of the YouTubes you might want to watch, uh, they are for the commercial production. We're strictly at home, small scale here. And we're not going to go after the heavily marketed supplies that you can buy in a complete microgreen kit. We're going to do this uh, on the economy side. And again, try it, see if you're going to like it. And these, by the way, are uh, five of the ones that I grew right here in my home. Starting the supplies, you're going to need a container and a lid, maybe, and cover, maybe. We'll, show, we'll see the details on each of these. You'll be using a clean potting medium. We'll go into detail on that, too. You'll want untreated seeds, and I'll discuss why that's important. Drinkable water. Plants need water. We'll look at that and how to deliver that water plus light, and some things you might expect, not expect about light. 
and scissors. I'll show you the ideal scissors, and you may already have them, but any scissors. First of all, the container. Now, I picked this one for size purposes, and it is a container that you may buy for microgreens. It is five by five, and the important part is two inches deep. Here's some other containers you might have around the house already. They could be paper. They could be one of these clamshells that you brought home some dog, doggy bag food to go, uh, or it could have been a to-go delivery. And I purposely flipped the picture on this set, the clear on the bottom, the dark on the top. You could use it in either direction as a top and a lid. And here's some smaller containers, but they are also about two inches deep. So you may already have containers on hand. And it's a good thing for the ecology to recycle, upcycle, reuse these things. Now here's ones that I did use and they are sitting on my, my that looks like they're on the washer that day. And I did reuse uh, to-go containers on the top. Those are, were from some Chinese food for all, all three of those. And in the forefront, those three containers, the two rectangles and the circle in the center, those were from microwave food. So I cleaned them thoroughly, uh, hot water with soap, rinsed them hot water, sanitized them, made sure there was no residual soap or grease left on them. And I was able to upcycle, recycle the containers. Now, the containers optional requirements. Should you put in drainage holes or leave them solid? Well, drainage holes are a good idea, particularly with seeds starting, so you don't risk damping off. If there is any fungal fungus in there that could cause the damping off, excess moisture might cause your seedlings to fail. However, these are only going to live a week to 10 days, usually before you're harvesting, so you could leave it solid if you're careful in the way that you water. And we'll look more at that under watering. Now, do you need a lid or no lid? The lid's going to be handy for our germination process, and I'll show you why in a moment, but you don't have to have a lid. However, if you do have drainage holes, you can then use the lid as the catching tray, which is the third attribute there, tray or no tray. If you have holes in the bottom, you're going to want to have a tray, and it could be the lid, or you could use an alternate container as your tray. If you are watering and there is water in the tray, you want to empty that out after it's drained through because you don't want your seedlings to be too wet. Uh, by the way, the, uh, you're going to see uh, some of my other um, examples. I started to use these meal prep food containers I did buy, and you can get them, this is showing you at Walmart, but you can get them at Sam's or any other place. They're about seven and a half by five, bite that, two inches deep, and they did come with a lid. Uh, it says 60 on there, it's really 30 containers with a lid, 30 lids, 30 bottoms, or either direction that you lay them. And they came to about 35 cents a piece if you do want to buy them. That's one option. Now, the part about your growing medium, I know there are mats that you can buy for microgreen growing. They kind of look like a sponge. But remember, we're trying this economically and see if you like it at home. So you can use a potting mix. Now, the difference between a potting mix and potting soil Potting mixes do not contain soil. A potting soil may or may not contain soil. So I stayed with on the mix side because with soil, I wanted to avoid any fungus, bacteria, or weed seeds or insects. So I stayed with a potting mix. Most of uh, the potting mixes generally for their main media is either sphagnum peat, coconut core or they're wood based and you can read the side of your bag look at look for the details if you are buying it online you'll also want to see if they contain perlite or vermiculite because these both of these will help keep the soil 
puffy air circulating through it. Uh, that's a very big attribute of perlite, which by the way is a natural substance. It's a fired volcanic material. It permits drainage and it keeps air within the soil mix. Vermiculite is silicon based and it holds moisture. So it will keep your seedlings moist. And another reason why that you'd want to drain off the tray if you are doing this with holes in the bottom of your container. You want to choose a potting mix that is chemical and fertilizer free. You're going to be eating these very quickly from their maturing, and you're going to be clipping them to eat them very close to that soil surface. So look at the contents and it says the list is shown and I kept that hidden so it wasn't overwhelming. That will show you the contents of what is in that potting mix. Now it's going to vary and you may see some that say it has a starter fertilizer which is a minimal amount of fertilizer. Now some will say they're organic as in the case of this uh, burpee eco-friendly natural organic. You can tell it's organic by the OMRI, that's the Organic Materials Research Institute, I believe, and uh, they do list organic materials. So the fertilizer, the extra boost, may be from a natural source like uh, worm castings. Uh, some will tell you the source and some do not, uh, but if it is listed with the OMRI and organic is important to you, you can uh, see that listed on the labeling. It's really not necessary to have a fertilizer, again, the short life, and you're really getting all the vitality of that seed just germinating. And the two things I already mentioned to use a mix so there are no weeds or other seeds in there because you don't want to be snipping and eating those and uh, you can avoid insect problems. The one that I did use to show you an alternate was Fertilome and this one was made with Canadian smag sphagnum peat moss. Now I got a little concerned because it also said it was using two types of limestone there. So I was like, what the heck is that about? Why do I have? It's because Canadian sphagnum peat moss has a very low pH, making it very uh, acidic. So they add the different limestones in order to make it more neutral, moving it to more alkaline. So I did research that one. This one worked fine for me, though I also noticed that it looked like it had little sticks in it here and there from the uh, the peat moss being harvested and uh, I picked them out just so because my seeds were very very tiny I did pick some out they're very proud that there's no bark added but you might get some little extra uh, sticky items and and I did pull those out so this one worked for me and very limited on what the additives were in there. Why you want untreated seeds. And there is an example of the treated seeds and aren't they beautiful? But I don't think we want to be eating them right after germination. Uh, some seed treatments could be for a fungicide. Uh, they could be treated with an insecticide like a BT, a Bacillus thuringiensis against worm activity. They could also come fertilizer wrapped, or they could simply have a treatment on it to be a pelletized to make them um, for agricultural purposes to uh, aid the seeding process uh, by machine. So when used to seeds, you want no chemical, biological, or physical method of treatment done to the seeds. We're going to be eating these when they're very young. Some common seeds that you might want to grow your microgreens, the broccoli family, and they have a very short growth cycle and they're quite tasty and you have a very broad selection there. I found that the pop choy grew very fast. It's a very tiny seed, so I had lots and lots of productivity there. It had a great crunch to it. The broccoli, wonderful, wonderful. 
And I never knew that radishes were in the same family. And I did use more than one variety of radish, and I had more success with that cherry ball that you see than I did with the French champion that I planted after. So uh, variety may make a difference in what you choose, even if you're choosing a particular plant type. There are also the lettuces and lettuce and greens, which uh, are related to asters and daisies. Amazing. Leeks and onions uh, in the allium family, those are going to be monocots, so you're going to have straight shoots coming up for those. In the herb family, there's the umbrella ones like celery, carrot, parsley, dill, cilantro, cumin, all show, shown there. Delicious. But you also have things in the mint family like basil and oregano. What a great pop they put in. And they, they also give you a, an Italian kind of flavor if you're seeking that. So absolutely, these are also microgreen options. Across the bottom there, I haven't tried yet the peas, beans, and sunflowers. Those uh, need a pre-soaking uh, to help with uh, soften their shells. And as I told Catherine earlier, I'm going to do peas next because my dog Penny loves peas and it's a little too early to do it outside. So she's going to have pea microgreens. I chose this one. Uh, just to show you the different varieties that are available. This is from Johnny Seed Company. And at, they're also telling you a bit about the flavor. And if it's important to have organic seeds for you, they have them available and will specify them as OG organic. And this is also telling you what to expect when they come, uh, when they're germinating and come up. Or if you're looking for that uh, nice uh, popping on an appetizer, there's purples, greens, reds, a little colorful extra that you could be putting on your food. If you are going to do mixed seeds in the same container, I suggest buy them, buying them as a mixed seed package. These are shown from Johnny's Seeds. There are in other seed companies. I'm using this as an example. Why you want to get them packaged together. They've already tested and tried it and they know they're going to have the same germination time. They'll also mature together, and they generally have the same consuming usage that you'd be using it for the same flavor impact. And I will also say that if you are looking in these seed catalogs, I'll show more, they're not only giving you growing advice, they're going to be giving you serving advice too. Now, there are certain seeds that you don't want to use for micrograins. Nothing from the nut, nightshade family. So no tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, or potatoes because they contain alkaloids, which at high levels can be toxic or make you sick at any rate. So do not use anything in the nightshade family for microgreens. Tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, Potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, and potatoes are a no-no. Now, where to get those seeds? Hmm. Well, if you're trying to be economical, you can buy them in bulk, and you can get them from the local garden or farm store or packages from the local garden or farm store. And you can also, because you're buying local, supporting local is good, of course, but they may also give you some advice. So uh, I suggest that. And I did buy in bulk, and there are bulk uh, local retailers in, in the Denton County area. They, they're in Denton, I know in Grapevine, South Lake area, that you can buy seeds in bulk. You can also get your package seeds locally from big box stores. You know what I mean by that, discount stores as well as grocery stores. Now, my experience is in the past month, as I dash into some of these stores, their seeds may be outside in the patio area or a simply a uh, tarp covered kind of outdoor garden center. Those seeds have been through some pretty dramatic temperature changes lately. 
Not so much moisture changes that we could use, but they're out there exposed. You need fresh seeds for your microgreens. So be a little leery of the mass merchandisers and uh, monitor where they have been putting their seeds before you pay for them. The reputable seed companies that you can buy from via online or catalog are going to have the widest varieties as well as give you excellent educational information as well as serving advice too. And this one uh, from Botanical Interests is showing um, the, the full layout, uh, including a wine selection with their Italian Amaro blend microgreens. So enjoy the, the presentation potential as well as the, the education of how to grow them when you select from these seed catalogs. There are more. And if you're interested also in organic sources, I found this from the Penn State Extension Service. And you can take a print screen of this or simply um, uh, do pennstatepsu.edu seeds. And uh, this will come up for you. This is part of a PDF that includes the how to on microgreens and gives this as a organ an organic reference at the end. So I thought that was very helpful. It, uh, and it's from their, their AgriLife from another state. How much seed? Oh, I, I, I did this by trial and error. So this is showing really for production for uh, the uh, retail side of this. And they generally use a 1020 tray. 10 inches by 20 inches, two inches deep. And they're measuring in grams. Don't have to memorize this, but what I wanted to point out is the seed sizes will vary. So on say radishes, they're using one ounce for this very large tray. As And if you keep looking down on uh, mustard seeds, it's uh, they're going to do three and a half tray trays with one ounce. I didn't have anything small enough to measure an ounce in weight. So what I was doing was using a half teaspoon measuring like you use for baking. And that was giving me a gauge on how many I should put in my containers. And I'll show you some of that. I was using a half tea level teaspoon. And from that, through trial and error, I learned how much I should be using. If you saw in the previous examples, the microgreens are very densely growing. It's not like you're going to transplant these and, and you hope to keep those roots intact. No, these are densely planted and you're harvesting them young. So this is just a relative on because of the size of, size of the seeds, you use less weight wise when the seeds are now that water, it's drinkable water, so whatever you drink at home is fine. If you drink tap water, tap water is good. If you drink bottled water, I would be watering these seeds and the very young shoots with the same water. Not necessary to use rainwater, distilled, or any special water. It's fine the way it is. But whatever you use, whatever you drink, bees will like it. Uh, do not add any fertilizer or hormones, any, any secret sauce to the water, plain water. Again, you're going to be eating these relatively quickly from the time that they are watered. So don't put any type of, I'll call it contamination on them. Now a spray bottle, highly recommended for this process because you can control how much moisture, how wet you're making those seeds. And Initially, after they germinate, you can continue to water with the spray bottle. If they get taller, maybe by two days after germination, I wouldn't spray them because they tend to fall over and hit each other and then they start to, uh, to stay too wet. Then if you had holes in the bottom of your container, you want to water from the bottom, from the tray on the bottom. If you have not put holes in, just water very a small stream from the sides 
to let it go all the way around. Do not over water if you have not put holes in the bottom. Now light. This is going to be the surprising part. Uh, this is a sunset in my backyard, but you're going to need darkness. What? You're going to need daylight, yes, or if you don't have adequate daylight, household lights, and if you have fluorescent lights, you may use those for your young sprouts, but you're going to need darkness. We'll talk about that in our how-to. Now here's the scissors I absolutely like. If I'm appearing, I don't know if you can see me, but I love these scissors. They're uh, kitchen shears. So they're either going to be called kitchen shears. They come apart and you can put them in the dishwasher. I have a second pair that I keep out only in the garden and I use it for harvesting. It has this little notch in it that you can use when you're cutting off, say, uh, melons. It's very, very helpful for melons and squash. So I love these out in the garden too, but these are going to be used to snip off your microgreens uh, for, for your yummy eating. So I recommend these and they come apart um, for washing. They're also known as chicken shears or poultry shears uh, with this notch in, in the center, uh, towards the center, you can actually cut bones with it. And there's also a bottle opener, some good things on the side. And I think you can crack nuts with it. So uh, not very expensive, and you probably uh, can use them for many things around the house or a separate set I use in the garden. Love these shears. Let's talk about that planning process. We've got all of our equipment and supplies. We're ready. Here's the how-to. First step, let's put the soil mix in your container. Have the soil mix moistened. So by moistened, if uh, it's moist to the touch, and if you picked it up, it would stick together, but not stay in a ball. You could still get it to come apart. You could get it to crumble away. You want it pre-moistened in that container. Then you're going to have your seeds, and I started with a half teaspoon, which was fine for, yes, fine half teaspoon for the pop choy and the broccoli because they were very tiny seeds. I would recommend a larger amount, probably a, tea, a full teaspoon for the radishes uh, and the beets, probably a full teaspoon too. The beets I was not successful at. You want to choose a variety with a faster uh, germination than I did. And uh, you may even want to pre-soak them a bit. The beet seeds are a compound seeds and more than one seedling will come out of it. I was not successful with them, but I think it was my selection of types. So by all means, it's a good one to do for microgreens. They are generally longer in their germination though. Then you're gonna pat your seeds down because you want good contact. You're not burying these, you're just patting them down in to make good contact with that soil mix. Then that's when the sprayer for the water comes in very important. You're going to spray these to moisten the seeds as well as the mix that's below them. You're not soaking them, you're spraying them to get them nice and moist. And because you're spraying, you're not knocking them real far into the soil mix. So spray. By the way, my sprayer was at the dollar store before the price went up, but you can uh, use a uh, any household clean sprayer, regular water. So here's our next step. And be surprised here, right away, you're going to cover with a dark cloth. This actually is a very dark royal blue towel that I put over top of these seed containers. You want them to be in the dark for two to three days. That's why putting the lids on is going to help if you're going to be putting a, a dark cloth on top. Uh, in um, the uh, uh, manufacturer's uh, portion, they, they often use another dark tray and lay that dark tray on top rather than a cloth. Or in those other to-go containers that I showed you, you could use the clear portion, the lid, for your planting 
and then use the dark portion as your dark cover lid. And when I say two to three days, I do mean two to three days. That if you put them, the seeds in on Monday afternoon, keep them covered Tuesday, keep them covered Wednesday, take it off sometime Thursday, Thursday afternoon. Can you peek? Yes, you can peek, but they really like to be in the dark. I was amazed. This is going to be in warm indoor conditions. You don't need to use a heating pad. It's fine just using regular, uh, your ambient, I guess you would call it your regular uh, household temperature. All right, so day zero, when you put them in the planters and you're going to keep them covered until day three, essentially, and to take it off. Now, why dark is important, and I brought a couple uh, quotes here, so you don't have to believe me, but you can see this on YouTube. Uh, most seedlings, actually, particularly vegetable seedlings, do germinate best in the dark. They could be inhibited by light. The light can affect the way that the gases are being expelled from the seeds germinating. So if some of the references say seal them with plastic wrap, I would leave a little air in there because they're breathing beings too. They're breathing, they're alive and they're breathing. So in the dark, but don't make them air tight because they do need air to do their, their business. They're breathing as they start to grow. This was very fascinating to me. Choose the dark side for your seeds. The warm indoor conditions, I brought this chart out to just show you the optimal range for germination, and I highlighted it in a light green there. And it's generally room temperature, if you call your room temperature between like 68 and 72 here in the winter, they're going to germinate. Is it optimum? Not necessarily. You don't need optimum. You're doing this for home use. It may be a few hours different of how they germinate. Uh, compared to if you were doing it in a very controlled environment. So normal room temperature is going to be fine. Uh, I do know that on this chart, and don't be confused, there are some nightshades on here, don't be confused. The chart is merely showing that uh, germination range of um, temperatures there. Now, our next step, we're going to uncover and place in a lighted area. You're going to introduce light. Don't put them in the blazing sun. They'll be in shock. So introduce the light lightly. So uh, on this, you can see my little seedlings are starting to germinate and come up. My beets did not. That one little sprout that you see was a pop choy that you know went, went rogue and hopped over into that other container. So my beets did not germinate at the same time. They did eventually. Let's take a closer look at what happened to this germination. Well, some of these guys are looking a little fuzzy. Let's take an even closer look. Downright fuzzy. Do not panic if you take off your cover and they look fuzzy. This is normal. That fuzz I've read is either aerial roots or mycorrhizal fungi, and it's nothing to worry about. And it's kind of like an embryonic fluid that they're protecting themselves as they're coming up. If you use your spray bottle and lightly spray them, it dissipates right away. And as you introduce them to light, the yellowing will go away and they'll start turning green and they'll stand up. It's, it's just a miracle, it's nature's miracle. So. Don't toss them thinking they got mold and don't think they're dying. They're fine. A little spray, let them have some light, and that fuzz will dissipate. It's not mold. That's a real close-up there. And that was taken with my, my phone. Very cl close-up look at all those little, little furs coming out. They're fine. They're going to grow. Now the light. The sunlight is very good. Should you put them on the windowsill? 
Well, some of my re references, resources said, probably not, particularly in winter. The initial sunlight may be too strong for one, and there may be a dramatic change in the day and night temperatures by having them on the windowsill. And it may be drafty in the windowsill area. Plus, if you have uh, marble or granite windowsills, it's going to keep their feet quite cold. So take that into consideration. This is a picture from a university. It's from Penn State also. And you can see they have theirs on a windowsill. I don't know how deep that windowsill is either. And I don't know what time of year it was. If you use fluorescence, uh, don't leave it on all, all day and all night. My mind, you're going to see them. Mine got really leggy when I left them in fluorescent light. They actually did better with the indirect sunlight than they did with the fluorescence because they got leggy very, very quickly. A grow lamp is not necessary. We're doing this economically. Plus, you're only doing this for that seven to 10 days and you, you don't want them getting leggy. Now, uh, what happened here? I went backwards or something. Oh, my next part was keeping them moist for seven to 10 days. I've already mentioned this, that do water from the sides or the bottom sides if you don't have holes, from the bottom if you do have holes in your container. And these are the same four uh, planting boxes. And you can see what happened in a matter of just one week. From seeds to tiny sprouts, to they're ready to rock there. And uh, you could cut them out seven days and enjoy them. And I did let them go 10, 12 days and kept harvesting because it makes a lot more than I expected. And they were delicious. You're going to cut with scissors to eat. Because of the, um, the light airiness of that potting mix, if you try to pull them, you're going to also have potting mix. It's one of the reasons when you put the potting mix in, you want it near to the top of the container so you can just go across and snip to do your harvesting. So cut with scissors to eat and enjoy. Some of the problems you may run into. Mold, there is mold that isn't really mold. So remove the cover after germination, don't recover them. So you're not trying to keep that closed in greenhouse condition, remove the cover after germination. If it is uneven growth, you've overseeded or you have light issues. If they're slow, it's because you didn't give them a blackout period or enough of a blackout period. That's why I found the full three days was best for, for my seeds. And if I did anything in the seeding, I underseeded, so I needed, I really need to add more seeds. Mine needed to be more condensed together, but I found that through trial and error, and uh, you can try to. Yellowing, if they're yellowing, they need so a light source, and they will green up with the light, whether it is uh, lamp lights, fluorescent lights, or simply sunlight coming through the window. And pests, you shouldn't really be getting insect pests. I can't say anything about your pets. You probably want to keep these out of reach of cats and dogs, uh, but uh, you should not be getting insect pests. And if you do, your suspects are probably plants, other plants in the area. Some common questions I had or I've seen others ask online, can you reuse the potting mix? There's the bottom, I turned my, my container over. That's the bottom after about 10 or 12 days. Look at how those roots went rampant in the bottom of that container. So no, it's too tight, it's too well used to reuse it right away for new seeds to, to germinate. You can compost a bunch, and it does compost very, very quickly, mine did outside, or I've been putting them, I've been trying this so often and enjoying it so much. I've just been emptying the mix into a separate container outside and I'm going to use it in the bottom of my spring planting uh, um, containers to, for filling the bottom. 
Can you reuse the containers? Yes, you can. You do want to wash them thoroughly, uh, very hot, soapy water, well rinsed, sanitized, so you can reuse them for growing. I wouldn't return them into the food containing area. I would just shoot, personally, I would just use them for growing after that. And what if you're too successful? You have too many microgreens and they're going to start to bolt. You can clip and store them in a container. Uh, do not wash them before you store them. So store them, harvest them, store them probably in a uh, sealable container, or you could put them in a plastic bag, tape them for lunch, wash them before you eat them, and do keep them cool, refrigerated. And uh, they're just delicious and, and fun fun. These are some resources that I used and a webinar I attended from Harris County in Texas, and they gave a great demo too. And um, you can also, I would suggest that Penn State example there on the bottom, do Google microgreens, psu.edu. They probably have six different articles and they deal with different aspects like the uh, germination uh, uh, timing, as well as the seed density and uh, very, very good uh, overall information just to make sure you have healthy greens that uh, you get what you're expected. So these are some of the resources. You could take a print screen of that. And while that is up, I did want to show you some other containers. Can you see me, Catherine? Sure can, Linda. Okay. I'm holding this blue container up. It came with uh, mushrooms in it, and I have it nicely washed. And it's deeper than the two inches. So I probably, you could use this, but you're going to be using extra soil. Uh, you do want to fill it up so you're going to be able to snip across the top when you are harvesting. It's okay, but I would two inches is generally what is recommended for microgreens. And here's two others that I showed on the pictures. They could be clear or a thicker frosted kind of plastic. That's fine. Again, holes or no holes, up to you. Here's one that came with a microwave meal. I think this is like healthy choice. This already has the holes, so you could put your growing medium in here, your soil mix, and then you can use this as the catch tray. You would need to cover it with something dark to get that germination phase, but you have holes in it automatically in its own ready-made drip tray. Washed very thoroughly, soap and water rinsed in very, very hot water. And probably the stars of the show, I want to show you some of my crops. So this one, actually I have two of them. These are both radishes and they are French champion radishes. And this is at the half teaspoon uh, for each one. Some of the differences between them, this one was planted on the 10th, which is, help me here. 14 days ago, no, it's like, what was the 10th, 12 days ago, 12 days ago. And you can see that it's leggy. These are the ones that I left the fluorescent lights on. And the difference between this one and the other one, this is from the 14th, which is one week old, and same amount of seeds. The one on this side, that's the younger, looks denser and it is. I added the seeds down in. I forgot on this one. I was just excited, spray them. So the pat down for the good contact made a difference. Now, I also want to show you, and I'll, I'll keep up this uh, radish. This is the same amount of seeds, a half teaspoon with broccoli. And this one was also done on the 10th. So this one is uh, 12 days old. Absolutely ready to much. So why you fill to nearly the rim? 
I would come through with my scissors and just chop from right here. I can't really do it and grab them holding it, but I would just shear off from this area and have them ready to munch. I'm going to do that. There's just a group here, and they're ready, munchable. Very good, very fresh, very good. So I'm going to go to my question and answer screen. I really don't do any presentations without Penny appearing. So here is Penny on our question and comment screen. And uh, you could either open up the lines or Catherine, do we have any questions in chat? We do have a few questions in chat. And Linda, I am totally inspired to try to grow microgreens on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. And our first question comes from Missy. She said, can the, or she asked, can potting mix be reused multiple times? If you compost it in between, you saw how dense those roots get, it's amazing. So the next batch of seeds wouldn't be able to, to really make the adequate contact, contact. Plus it does compress a bit. You want it to be fluffy. So um, I compost it and I'm not reusing it for microgreens, but it's good for other plants. Awesome, thank you. And Pat is asking Linda, do you need to wash them after you harvest them and before you eat them? I just ate them plain, uh, but it is recommended to wash them. That's up to you because like uh, me too out in the garden, those tomatoes, the green beans, they peas, they don't make it in the house all the time before they're washed. So uh, it is recommended to wash them. But if you're going to store them, don't wash them first, only wash them before you eat them. <laughs> 